Good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah Hunstead, and tonight we are talking about rashes in children. I am absolutely excited to be here with you tonight because this is a subject that is very close to my heart. As a mum of two, I have had uh, my kids covered in different things at different times, some of them rashes, some of them other disgusting things as well. Uh, but in my career as a paediatric nurse, I have certainly seen almost everything as well. And I have the absolute absolute pleasure of having uh, Dr. Aaron Johnson with me tonight, who is a paediatric emergency physician at Cub Care and does quite, probably quite a few other things as well. But I think uh, he also go by, goes by the handle of As a J, and I suggest that he should probably do the rest of his introduction because he will do a better job than I will. So, As a, do you want to give us a little introduction about what you do and Cub Care as well? Uh, yeah, thank you, Sarah. So, as you stated, I'm a, um, a paediatric emergency physician. Uh, I'm working mainly at the Queensland Children's Hospital in their emergency departments. Um, colleagues of ours have started up Cub Care, which is uh, an after hours telehealth service for paediatric emergency pro uh, problems, uh, dealing with things that can be, you know, look, obviously looked at and managed. Uh, visually, uh, obviously, rashes are a big one. We've had a, we've had a few presentations for that lately, um, but also sometimes those kind of decisions about do I need to leave the house, pack all the kids up, get to the hospital, wait around, get seen and then be sent home? Uh, or is this something that could be dealt with tonight and then followed up in the morning maybe with my GP? So yeah, that's a good cup care. Yeah, such a good service that uh, I tell you what, as a parent is something that is greatly, greatly needed. So tonight, as I said, we are going to be talking about rashes in children. We have some fantastic pictures to show you as well. But before we go any further, what I'd love you to do is make sure that you tag anybody in the comments below who you think will benefit from this information. And also, if you could just give me a thumbs up or a wave just to make sure that all the technology is working well. Well, And remember, if you can't actually stay tuned in for the entire time that we're on tonight, don't worry, we will be posting this both to the Cub Care page and to the CPR Kids page afterwards as well. So why don't we uh, start getting into uh, the rashes, as of Now, what we will be uh, doing is accepting your questions as well. So remember, type them in the comments below. We may not answer them straight away, but we will be able to get to them. So uh, keep those comments and questions coming as well. So as of when it comes to rashes in kids, where do you want to start? What do you want us to tell us about first? Um, I think the first thing to know is that children children do get lots of rashes. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you know, it's one of the one of the primary reasons for presenting to emergency departments and GPs um, across the country, uh, and so therefore rashes do generate a lot of concern. Now, the reason for that is uh, some rashes can be signs of very serious illnesses. So that's certainly one of the things that I really want people to take away from today is the signs and symptoms of serious illnesses that are associated with some rashes. We are going to talk about some less serious illnesses and more common illnesses after that. But um, certainly one of the big things I think that most people have learnt over the last few years or many years uh, are what we like to call the non-blanching rashes. Now, mm -hmm. blanching is a word that we use freely in the kind of healthcare system but may not mean much to most people. So when we say blanching, we talk about when you have the rash on the, on the arm and you push on the rash with your finger and mm -hmm. you, can, you can actually see it disappear and then you remove your finger, it returns back. Now, most people, I think, would be more used to what we call like the glass test. That's how a lot of people have been taught, using one of your round, clear uh, kitchen glasses, rolling over the rash, you can still see through the glass and see if the rash disappears. Now, any rash that appears on a child, whether they're febrile or even if they still look well at the time, that is non-blanching, should, should be seen by a health professional soon. Yeah, absolutely. So that that is one thing. And it, we've got to remember, too, that as parents, we shouldn't be diagnosing anything. That's up to you guys. That's up to the doctors to actually, you know, be diagnosing what is wrong. What's important as parents is that we simply recognise when we need to get help. And that's the important bit. So exactly what you've said there, that if there is a non-blanching rash, so that rash when you press on it and it doesn't go away and your child has a fever or is appearing unwell, then it is off to the doctors. That is something that needs to be seen quickly. Absolutely. Yeah, I said, sorry, sir, I, I would certainly reinforce it as well. We'd much rather, we'd much rather have a person come in because they were over worried about a rash 
that, that, that was benign rather than have someone not come in because they weren't worried about a rash. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. And because that's the other thing as well is that you've got to trust your gut too. That, I mean, I know that in, in certainly in my experience in the emergency department, and I have no doubt that you've had this as well, that parents have that intuition. They know their child better than anyone. They know when their child is becoming unwell. And so always trust your instincts. If something is not right, err on the side of caution, go and get a medical review. Really, really important. Yeah. It's, it's actually on our list of um, for working up a, an unwell or septic child. One of the risk factors is parental concern. So mm -hmm. don't ever think that we're not going to take your concerns seriously. Yeah, exactly. That is so true. All right. So the, that's when we need to be worried. Obviously, kids get rashes all the time um, because there's some things that just crop up. They're things that perhaps the GP can deal with or that we may be able to deal with at home. But what we'd love to do tonight is just reassure people about common rashes as well. And it, people often we don't know what they look like. Uh, so we've got some great pictures to show you as well. So if I will share my screen and we will bring up some of these pictures and you can tell us a little bit um, about what we've got here. So let's start off with this lovely looking rash, which uh, if there's any preschool teachers out there, you're going to be going, oh, I know what that is. I have seen that a thousand times. Kids have given it to me as well. It is awful. So what would, would you like to tell us about this one? Yeah, so um, as you said, I'm sure there's a lot of preschool, kindy, creche, daycare workers uh, and obviously parents as well who might recognise this pretty well straight away. What we're looking at here is a, is a kind of a classic presentation of hand, foot and mouth disease, okay? So when we, when we look at rashes, um, the doctors use certain terms so it, to help describe them so when we're talking to our colleagues or to the dermatologists. So if I can get you to just to focus on the hand to start with, you can see there's those small little fluid-filled uh, blisters on the head. So we talk about them being being vesicles. So you can see on the certainly just underneath the thumb and even on the tip of the thumb and on across the palm, there's a couple of those little vesicles, little blisters. Uh, so the actual virus is contained inside those as well. So that's one of the great ways the virus has for spreading itself. Obviously, when little little Timmy gets this, likes to put his hands on things, likes to touch people, likes to lick his hand and lick all the other children. Um, so which is just what children do. It's just a, a, mm -hmm. a delightful thing that keeps me in business all the time. Uh, when we look at the when we look at the the child's mouth, you'll see similar sort of looking appearance. You won't see the vesicles as large; they're often more flat, uh, almost like little flat blind pimples. And if you look closely on the tongue, you can see some small lesions on that child's tongue as well. Now, hand, foot, and mouth is one of the one of the most common re common viruses we see in the emergency department. It's caused by a type of virus called an an enterovirus, uh, and there's one specific virus that causes what we call classic hand, foot and mouth disease, uh, which obviously, as the name implies, causes lesions on the hands, the feet and the mouth. Uh, but we do get variations of those introviruses as well. Some of them will cause lesions on the mouth and the hands, leave the uh, feet completely spared, but might have lesions all across their groin instead. Mm -hmm. Now, the way these child children present is usually they're unwell with a fever for the first 24, 48 hours before, before any lesions actually appear. So they'll just be a bit miserable and sad. You might take them to the doctor, looks in their ears, looks in their throat, says everything looks pretty good. And then over the next day or so, as that illness progresses, the fever might start dying down and the lesions start coming up. Now, a really, with most of these rashes we're going to talk about, there's no cures for any of these things. There's no, there's no hand, foot and mouth treatment, as in this will cure the virus. So what, what, what these children need are what we call supportive cares. The big problem with these kids is they've got sore hands, they've got sore feet, but worse than that, they've got really sore mouths. Mm. Now you can see our, our little one's face, there's even a little bit of drool on the outside of the chin there because what these kids will rapidly figure out is that every time I swallow, that hurts. The kids aren't silly, so they think, well, I'll just stop swallowing, which is a real good short-term strategy because obviously if it hurts to do something, you stop doing it. Now, it's not a great long-term strategy, obviously, dealing with hydration. So we get a lot of these children presenting to us at around day three or four of the illness who've just decided, I'm not going to eat anything, I'm not going to drink anything. So the main the mainstay of treatment with this rash is certainly um, pain relief. So we're talking, obviously, your paracetamols, your ibuprofen as a start. Sometimes these kids can get more severe and need stronger painkillers as well, which can be um, assessed at the hospital or by your GP. 
The most important thing is really keeping up their hydration. We know that these rashes come, they're very unpleasant, and then they get over them as well. There are, there are some very few variations that can be uh, quite serious of hen, foot and mouth. They are quite uncommon, quite rare in Australia, but do exist around the world though. And when it comes to hand, foot and mouth, how long do you need to keep your child home from school or home from daycare for? So ideally, as we, as we touched on before, ideally you should be keeping them until all those blisters, any, any exposed blisters on the hands uh, or on, on the feet less so, um, once they've all kind of popped and crossed it over, you should try to keep them clean. If they've got any lesions in their mouth with their secretions, they will still be um, being ongoing infective as well. And obviously the downside of this is someone someone's often brought the disease to your kindy, which is where your kids picked it up. And sometimes I can feel like I'll just send it back to the kindy and pay it forward. Uh, but, really all, but really all you're doing is just prolonging someone else's discomfort. And I, I recognise it's bad and unpleasant. The good news is most kids will only get this once, but because there are variations, some kids can be lucky enough to get hand, foot, mouth, or variations three or four times. There we go. Yeah. That's, yeah. That was our household. We we had that one of my children had hand, foot, and mouth five times over the period of two years, and it was one of those ones where her mouth was just absolutely so painfully sore that yeah. the dehydration was the issue for us. So um, certainly those painkillers were so important. So, you know, being able to keep up the painkillers, keep up the fluids, and she was home until uh, all of this had um, cleared up, crossed it over, no more of those fluid-filled lesions. So it's one of those things where, unfortunately, it's common, but you can almost guarantee it will happen to your child at some stage. One of, the, what, one of the only good things about it is most adults won't pick this up, so mm -hmm. you can be happy to have your child drooling all over you, which is a plus. Uh, unfortunately, my wife, who doesn't deal with a lot of children when we stay with our uh, nephews in Chicago, developed burning feet and burning hands. I had no idea why. And then she came out essentially with hand, foot, mouth, which as a pediatrician was embarrassing. I didn't pick up on her. She wasn't really my age demographic for getting that. So she can attest yeah. to how unpleasant it is on the hands and feet at least. Yeah. No, awful. Not very nice at all. Okay. Now, next up, what do we have here? Ah, another very common one. What would you like to tell us about this one? So this one has, uh, this one has a couple of names. Uh, depending on where, whether you're wearing your, your medical hat or your school hat. Uh, a lot of people will know it as school swords, uh, but we refer to it as um, impetigo. So impetigo is caused by um, bacteria that live on your skin, uh, and certain bacteria, if they're, if they're trained a certain way or they have a certain virulence about them, uh, when they get access to broken skin, so it's the things, like, things that are popular in Brisbane at least, uh, mosquito bites, Kids obviously have, you know, they love a good scratch getting those mosquito bites. Any other sort of eczema or any other sort of broken skin. So if there's any surrounding bacteria either on the hands or, or in the surrounding wounds that can get in there, they can go to town. Now, the main bacteria is a bacteria called Staphylococcus aureus. Aureus is referred to for its golden colour, which you can see both, both under the lips there and also on that other area of skin, that lovely golden hue. Ah, uh, yes. It's such, yeah. So uh, the, yeah, known as golden stuff, exactly. So that lovely little crust there. Um, I feel like that everything you're talking about we've experienced in my house and it's all, you know, pretty gross. Um, I actually ended up with impetigo all over my nose and the side of my face after my daughter actually scratched me um, when we were doing something. So, you know, it's it's not just uh, the kids who can end up with it. You can end up with it too. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so obviously really important when you've got any broken skin, so scratches, you know that, making sure you're keeping them clean and staying on top of them. Sorry. Yep. So what's the treatment for this? And how? once again, because this is the question that everybody will want to know about, is how long do we need to keep our child in isolation for if they have impetigo? So obviously impetigo has varying levels. You can have obviously just several small spots, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, like the child under lips there, or they might have large areas as well. So uh, the first main, first step of treatment is usually uh, keeping it clean, Using a using a topical uh, topical antiseptic and monitoring it, and also keeping it covered. Keeping it covered helps to stop the spread to mm -hmm. other children, parents, etc. Um, moving on from there, um, certainly oral antibiotics can be used. Uh, the The mainstay of treatment is an um, antibiotic called flucloxacillin. Now, the downside for flucloxacillin is when made into a liquid, 
has all the has all the taste appeal of sort of liquid manure. So children aren't big fans of taking flucoxacillin. So often we will use alternative antibiotics that certainly may not be as good, but have a very good effect to them as well. There, um, there, there previously was a big uh, big push for sort of topical antibacterials, mm -hmm. uh, things like Bactriban and those sort of things. But that's certainly fallen out of favour these days. Okay. As for going back to school, if they've got widespread lesions that can't be covered, if they've got one or two lesions that might be small, a Band-Aid or a dressing can certainly uh, work well there. But any large lesions, and certainly if they're playing contact sports or roughhousing with other kids, uh, or should be in each other. Or with each other, which is, yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. uh, weirdly enough, boys, boys are much more susceptible to impetigo, probably for that same reason, just, you know, much more likely to be roughhousing each other. There are there are certain kids we worry a bit more with in Patago, um, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander kids. They have a higher rate of what we call um, MRSA, so methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So those kids um, can sometimes have it a bit worse and need a bit of a stronger treatment as well. Yeah. One other big problem with um, school sores, it can sometimes stick around for a while. So it kind of it goes from one kid in the house to the next kid, back to the first kid, back to the next kid. And so sometimes what you need is a full eradication. So, you know, washing all their washing all their sheets, washing all their clothes, full body washes of everyone in the family because it's just going to be bouncing back and forth and back and forth. And if you're having what we call recurrent school sorts, that's something to look at, having an eradication program. Excellent. Good. And another important thing to remember as well is that kids can't be picking and scratching at it because that is an important thing because obviously we've got to have spread control everything and I know that when my kids have been toddlers and they've ended up with this trying to get them to stop picking and scratching at it and then touching everything else is quite difficult so that covering once again is very very important and remember if in doubt make an appointment with your GP and go and get it sorted really important. So we've talked about the school sores. What do we have next on our slides here? Let's see. Ah, here we go. And what's very interesting is we've already had a comment about this one. So one of the comments uh, below that we had from Jennifer uh, was that the worst rash my daughter had was molluscum and not many people know about it. And, you know, here we go again. This is something that only one of my daughters has had, but she's had it quite terribly and it lasted a couple of years. So why don't you tell us about this lovely uh, rash? So, so this rash is uh, molluscum contagiosum, uh, and as you can probably tell by its more formal name, it's very contagious. So mm -hmm. it's caused by a small pox virus, so it's, it's another viral illness that causes this, uh, and when they get infected, they come out with these small little pearly papules. So you can see them all, they look, you know, almost like little skin tags almost, but they're quite shiny, they're, very, they're quite round and they're, and they're well demarcated. But they can, they can have variations on their size and shape, but they usually are quite small. Now, the big problem with molluscum is a bit like um, impetigo, but that it spreads through, just, well, mainly through direct contact. So one, one child's got it maybe on their you know, body and they're having a wrestle, they can spread it to the other child, but then also spreads on, 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 um, on things like towels. So, you know, so the first child uses the towel, second child's washing their hands or just, you know, giving themselves a quick wash, school sports, all those sorts of things they spread around. Uh, but then they can also be spread by actually, if you get the molluscan virus on your hand, in being well, you can then spread it to the other child from there. Now, the problem with it is it can be, uh, well, it can be mainly benign. That's, that's the first thing. And, and for most parents, they get lucky, they get a couple of lesions, they think nothing of it, and they go, ah, this is fine. But obviously, like our commenter, uh, and maybe like your daughter, uh, they can also be awful, awful, awful rash. So sometimes, especially, it depends on the, on the location. As you can see, that middle picture, that poor child's got one just above their eye. I know a colleague of mine actually had one um, um, in their eyelid, which was causing a constant uh, conjunctivitis. This was an adult, yet again. Um, sometimes if they, they come in the, in the, in the fold, so they can end, end up like under the armpits, the constant rubbing can be quite irritating. They can obviously be cosmetically upsetting as well. Obviously, if your child's got several molluscum over their face, that can be quite worrying, both for the child as well as the parents as well. Mm -hmm. 
Now, there's lots of, uh, you know, if you if you search molluscum contagiosum on Google, it comes up with pages and pages and pages of supposed cures when it comes yes. to everything from apple cider vinegar to putting gaffer tape over the top to sticking needles in them and flicking them out, which I can't even imagine doing that on, on your child. Um, what is the treatment for molluscum or is there actually any treatment at all? So um, it, almost everything you've said is uh, is a form of treatment. Um, the the main thing to know, if they do have a few and they're not bothering them, these will disappear sometimes in a few weeks, but usually about 75% of them will be gone within two years. So one treatment option is you can do absolutely nothing, try to limit their spread, and um, and they will just go away on their own. But as you've touched on, um, you know, doing things that I know a colleague of mine has actually treated these a bit like you would some sort of pimple and actually dug it and squeezed them out. Now, obviously, most of the children who get these, as you can see from the age of the kids looking at pictures, aren't going to be big fans of having things firmly squeezed against them. They're not going to be big fans of the Dr. Pimple Popper style technique and having these <laughs> things squeezed out. So I don't think you're going to win many friends with your children by squeezing them out. But that is a technique you can use if you, if you really desire to get rid of them. Um, yeah. Duct tape can cause that sort of localised reaction, which then the body forms a response against the virus itself, and that can help. Yet again, because when you go on the internet, as you said, if there's a thousand uh, cures, the reason there's a thousand cures is probably because none of them works perfectly. If there was a one perfect cure, there'd be one cure listed and that's what everyone would be using. Um, you can use things like um, uh, cryotherapy, freezing, those sort of things. The risk with those, they can actually leave small pale scars for doing those. Um, so there's no, there's no uh, base medicines or that, are, that are easily available for a lot of these things. There are, there are some certain kind of um, some stronger or fancy medicines, but they come with their own risks as well. So obviously with small cases of molluscum, there usually isn't much you need to do or much you want to do. With big cases, certainly seeing your GP and maybe if they're causing problems or getting recurrent infections, going down that pathway, you know, having some of those um, more more elaborate medications, which, you know, which I don't think are for the, are for the lay person. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, certainly we had them around for, we, when I say that, my child had them around for two years. She actually named them all. So they oh, all had nice. names. She said goodnight to them every night. They were like her pets. She was a little bit sad when they went away, but uh, anyway. That's I, was just gonna ask, I was just going to ask, was there some sort of leaving party when they left? Yeah, there was actually. There was a little oh, bit of sadness, but, you know, main, mainly happiness, I must say. So that's that's not a bad thing. All right. Now, this one, this one is a very interesting one because it's not very clear cut like the others. What would you like to tell us about this rash? So this rash, uh, so we'll go back to the description of the rash. So when we talk about rashes, we talk about small, small, small circles, which are completely perfect, which we call macules, or lumps, which are papules. Or we talked about the vesicles, the blisters before. This rash has what we call a morbilliform appearance. So it's still, it's still relatively flat. It might have a small area of rays, but you can see all the little shapes are quite irregular. Some of them have coalesced, some of them have joined together to make little strips. But generally, there's small irregular shapes, which we can see in this picture, are scattered mainly over the trunk and over the limbs as well. Now, the reason that this rash might be concerning to someone at first is this rash looks very similar to measles, which is a rash that we thankfully don't see a lot anymore. But this is a rash that we do see all the time. This rash is um, from a disease called roseola infantum or roseola. So roseola is a, roseola is, is a virus. Uh, it's, it's one of the herpes viruses, but not one of the ones that causes cold sores or other diseases. So it's one of the sort of lesser known herpes viruses. It's very common. Pretty much all children will get this disease between about six months and two years. Now, the reason why roseola is different to something like measles is roseola presents a bit like our hand, foot, mouth to start with. It starts with two, three days of high fevers, some sort of 39, that sort of stuff. Child's a bit miserable. But when you take them to your doctor, yet again, they look in their ears, they check their tonsils, they're doing everything, everything's perfectly clear. And then what happens around that day three, four, is that fever drops. And the fever drops completely, child goes back to normal, and then over the next couple of hours, this rash comes. And it spreads, as I said, basically all over the trunk and down the limbs. It usually spares the face. Now, if we saw this rash in a child who was still having high fevers, or having a, and having a cough or um, things like that, cough, conjunctivitis, runny nose, 
that would make us more worried about measles. But roseola has a classic presentation, high fever for a few days, fever drops, this rash comes out. And it's a very impressive rash. The parents are usually, they haven't been too bothered about the fever. They've had him checked, he looks all right. But as soon as this rash comes out, ambulance coming straight in, you know, calling your head, making sure we know they're coming in. Uh, but usually these kids are coming in, they're giving you high fives, they're eating ice blocks. These kids look well, but have this widespread morbilliform, that little patchy rash that's kind of everywhere, no regular shapes. So, yes, it's, it's, one, of, it's one of my favourite rashes for all the junior doctors to learn. Yeah, that's right. And when you press on this one, it goes away. It's different to those other rashes that, as I was talking about earlier, um, the ones that when you press on them, they don't go away. So that's an important distinction as well. And I must admit, for um, I've spent quite a portion of my career at triage. And then if I had a dollar for every single time I had a parent come in and go, They've had a fever and I thought they were fine now. The fever's gone, but now they've got this crazy rash, you know, because it is something that we did that we did see all the time. Now, and yes, do I keep going? I was, going. going? I was gonna say, and, and so for parents, don't feel bad for not knowing what it is. We get yeah. numerous student doctors who've obviously a lot of them don't have children who've never seen it before. And it, but it's a it's a classic pattern. And once and one, the, the problem for parents, once you've seen it once, your other child may not you may not actually get it. Some kids won't even come out in the rash for roseola. So it was used to be referred to as baby measles because it would happen a lot earlier, and the kids were usually completely fine as well. Yeah. Well, we've actually got a whole lot of questions that have popped up as well while we've been talking about this. Now, first of all, Wendy as well, she's just actually said that her son had roseola, which seemed like a while, but the fever didn't bother her. So the important thing that we need to remember there is that if your child does have a rash like this, that we're not making the diagnosis, it's about going to your doctor. And if uh, it's still continuing on, then going back and seeing them is an important thing because we expect rashes um, to end up going away. So I think that's an important thing. So always go back and speak with your doctor if you are unsure. Now, I'm going to skip back to Moloscum for just a moment before we move on to our... Perfect one because we have and I'm going to change that um, that description there because that is completely incorrect now that I have gone backwards now we have a question here and I've lost the question my goodness my screen is all over the place here I am trying to work under pressure here here we go I found yeah. it again okay so um, Danny has asked can children go to swimming lessons with molluscum what's your answer there Dr Azza the, the answer is uh, yes. Um, I mean, children, children can go to swimming lessons with molluscum. It's really important, though, in terms of with the, with the drying of the towels, the, the chamois, all those sort of sharing things um, that they're not spreading around. Obviously, uh, if we said that children with molluscum couldn't go to swimming lessons, I think sometimes we'd have kids out of swimming for two years. And I think yeah. I would imagine... If it, uh, you know, based on the number of children I see every day who have molluscum, sometimes it, you know, sometimes it's one or two. Um, so yes, I, I couldn't see any restriction for a child going swimming with molluscum. Probably wouldn't recommend water polo training, something where they're doing contact with contact with other children, but certainly doing basic swimming lessons. I think I think that would be completely fine for molluscum. Excellent. Now, nothing to do with any of the rushes we've been talking about. However, Alison has just asked. She's missed the start. Can we click on it later? Yes, you can. We'll be pasting this onto our pages so you'll be able to listen to all of the very, very wise words that Dr. Azza has been talking about. So don't worry about that. Absolutely, you will. Okay. I'd say, I'd say I'm saying a lot of words. I'm hoping some of them are wise, but we'll see. <laughs> I, you know what, I am learning a lot from this as well. So I think that you are giving a great value to everybody out there who's watching. So it is a good thing. And Naomi has also said that she came home from her first night duty back as a NICU nurse oh, to a kid with roseola. Yes, it's always that way, isn't it? As you get that phone call from school when you're on shift, things like that. Fun intro into many years of childhood rashes. Yes, you can guarantee at some stage your child will end up with a rash. It is just a rite of passage of childhood. I, th oh, I think it would be unheard of for a child to get through childhood without a rash. No, I would, uh, I, I, would, I would probably write that child up in some sort of medical journal if they've survived all those years without getting one rash. Something's going on with that kid. You'd want to study their DNA, wouldn't you? Find out what's yeah, going it's on. Right. Exactly. Okay, we skipped over the roseola again. And now one of, of another one, a very popular rash that people want to know about. Tell us about this one. So this is a rash that a lot of people might have many names for. So you might hear them called welts 
or you might hear them called wheels, so W-H-E-A-L-S, wheels, uh, but we call it um, urticaria. So urticaria is its more fancy medical name, but certainly welts and wheels are also fine as well. Now, as an adult, most of your experience uh, with urticaria is going to be from uh, taking a medicine you're allergic to, eating a food you're allergic to, being stung by a bee or some sort of plant you're allergic to. But to be honest, most of the urticaria we see in children uh, is what we call idiopathic, meaning we don't know what's causing the cause the urticaria, but the, but the leading theory is it's mainly viruses that cause this urticaria. Now, when it comes out, it can be as small as a 10 cent piece or it can be 50% of their body. It can be really impressive and really scary. So you can see, obviously, on our picture on the right, you've got lots of small, almost look, almost little rice bubble, little lumps over that area. Uh, and then when we look at our picture on the left, we've got those much larger welts, wheels looking style, uh, which is obviously spreading over that child's whole trunk there as well. Um, so this is this can be quite concerning for parents. One of the first things we want to clarify when we see kids with urticaria is, is there an allergic cause? Have they started a new medicine? Have they started a new food? Is any other sort of washing powders, any else, anything else in the house? What we usually find is no, 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 but he has had a runny nose and a fever for a couple of days, and then this is coming out. So whilst being fairly impressive to look at, the majority of urticaria is going to be quite benign as well. But one of the big problems with urticaria is it can stick around. So a lot of it goes in a day or two, but urticaria can last for weeks sometimes. It's also quite migratory. So you might, make up, might wake up in the morning and you've got large lumps all over our left arm and they think, oh, I better get to the doctor. By the time they get to the doctor, the left arm is pristine. But now it's all on the chest and some on the back and they think, oh, it's getting worse. Then they finally get in to see the doctor and the chest looks great now, but now it's on the right arm and the head. And it's a, it's a, it, it, so it can move around, which is not unusual. Um, and also it doesn't bother us greatly as well because we know it's just going to move around in those sort of patterns and that's good. The main thing we want to know is how's the child? Sometimes with urticaria, they can be quite itchy. And as we talked about before, whether it's for the impetigo or the hand, foot, mouth, these kids, they love to get their fingers in and scratch themselves, especially when they're trying to get asleep. Uh, so there's certainly a low dose of antihistamine, depending on the age of the child. We don't usually recommend it in kids under 12 months. Uh, but a low dose of antihistamine can help alleviate, alleviate a lot of the symptoms. Now, it can help remove the rash as well if the rash is bothering you to look at. But if the rash isn't bothering the child, the urticaria, there's, there's often no need to treat it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, you know, if they are incredibly itchy as well, then some of the things that you can do is distraction that, you know, what can you do to distract your child from the itchiness? Sometimes using a cool pack or a cool face washer over the top as yeah. well. So those sorts of things that can help distract them away from all of that scratching is really important. And I mean, I one of the things that we get asked a lot in our classes at CPR Kids is the fact that a lot of people, when they hear the word urticaria or wheels or welts, that we automatically associate that with allergic reaction. And I think yeah. what you highlighted really well here as a, is the fact that it isn't always associated with allergic reaction. And most importantly, somebody can have an allergic reaction or anaphylaxis and not have this rash as well. So that's an important thing that we need to remember that we don't automatically go to allergic reaction and that we don't automatically think that if somebody is unwell and is having anaphylaxis that they must have the rash for it to be like that. So I think busting that's those bits is a really important thing. Now another I just sorry let's stop you. So another one thing though about urticaria, it's not infectious as in if a child, another child touches the urticaria they're not going to receive the urticaria. So unlike our hand, foot and mouth or our molluscum, it is one of those things where the child can be continuing their normal activities. Obviously, there can be some sort of social stigma. If the child's got large red blotches all over their face or legs, that can be quite concerning to other parents or the daycare centre. But urticaria itself is not an infectious rash. The rash itself is not infectious. Yeah, absolutely. And just in case you were doubting it, here you go. Very wise words, Dr Azza. See? Well, thank you. Absolutely. Now, we do have a couple of more questions here, and please, um, we have gone a little over time tonight, but if you do have some questions, please type them in now before we wrap up. Uh, first of all, Catherine has just also said, thank you for giving the differential diagnoses. It's hard as parents to know how to differ between the benign and the more worrying conditions needing medical attention. And always remember too, Catherine, if in doubt, 
you go and see your doctor. They will never be cranky at you if you are worried about your child. Really, really important. Okay. And so uh, Wendy has also asked, is there um, good ointment or cream to have in the first aid kit for these types of brushes? Obviously, each is different in their own way, but is there something that we need to have in the first aid kit? Um, what would you like to say about that, Azul? Um, I mean, if we look, if we look at these brushes that we're going to touch on, uh, obviously the urticaria. There's not many creams that are going to be good for that, but keeping obviously um, some antihistamine in your first aid kit. So if you're travelling, things like that, that's always a good idea. Uh, for molluscum, there's not many ointments or cream for that. Uh, for the impetigo, having 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 an antiseptic um, wash and, tr and cream is good for those, keeping them clean. Uh, hand, foot, mouth. There's not much, and roseola. There's not much. So unfortunately, the answer is not really, Wendy. I'm sorry. Uh, but yeah, having, having some sort of antiseptic is always a good idea for many things, especially with kids. They love to get injured. Oh, they do, don't they? They absolutely yeah. do. Okay. And so Tracy has also asked, can kids go to daycare with roseola? Um, so the, the answer is they've usually um, had roseola at daycare. They'll start being febrile. Often parents will keep them home when they are febrile. When the rash comes out, um, a bit like what we talked about, the rash itself is not infective but the child can still be briefly infected at that time. The rash will usually fade within 24 hours, and at that point in time, they'd be safe to go back to daycare. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Now, one thing we have had is we've got a few questions here about uh, children who have specific rashes. Unfortunately, that's not something that we are able to actually talk about tonight, uh, purely because, you know, that's something that you actually need to go and be able to show your doctor. They need to have that visual, it's particularly with a rash. They need to be able to see your child. So if you are worried about something, you could always jump onto the Cub Care website and get one of the peds guys to have a look at you or you can make an appointment with your gp but unfortunately tonight looking at children's specific rashes isn't something that is in the scope that we can do right now but before we do finish up tonight i would like to ask the sage of rashes dr azza to tell <laughs> us <laughs> the top three things that you would like parents and families to know about when it comes to rashes in children I don't know, the old question without notice. All right. Um, and number one, and I think this doesn't apply to rashes or everything else, if you are worried about a rash or anything, go and see someone. We'd always much rather see a well child with a worried parent than not see a sick child with a parent who wasn't concerned. It'll be, we can see you very quickly with your well child, reassuring that you go home. Obviously, if you come in with a child who's become quite sick, you can end up spending a lot of time in hospital. So that's certainly the first takeaway. I want all parents to be empowered. Um, number two, if you do get any rash, the first thing I want you to do is do those glass tests. Um, does the rash disappear? Now, obviously, that's of high importance when they're febrile because we're worried about serious, serious infections such as um, meningococcal disease, pneumococcal disease. But also if, they are, if they're still well in themselves, so if they've got spots that aren't disappearing when you pull, because they can be markers of other diseases. So certainly always think about doing the glass test or looking to see if it blanches. Uh, and third, I guess, um, rather than, rather than paying, paying diseases forward, uh, obviously, if you receive disease at one place thinking, well, I picked up hand, foot, mouth there, I'll send him back, someone else can have it. You know, I, a bit like what we've learned over this last, you know, 2020, is that, you know, that sometimes the power of one is quite, is quite strong in that kind of, you know, disease can stop with us. So if you do have a child, sometimes, and I recognise, look, most years it's probably quite difficult for workplaces to understand. But I think in this year's and moving forward, I think with saying I've got an unwell child, I don't want to spread disease any, any further, I think most places hopefully will be, will be having it back and saying that's a great idea. Keep your child home because that means hopefully five other parents aren't taking time off work. And hopefully then you'll get some payback and then you'll have to take less time off work. That is, they're the, they're the three things I can bring forward. Yep. Once again, wise words again, as I thank you so much. Now, we do have a few more questions. We might try and just answer just a couple more of them before we sign off, just because obviously this is such a really popular topic. Oh, I'll try um, and speak really fast when I answer to sort of get the answer quickly. So Mary's asked, is it normal for older children to get roseola or is, you know, is this just a baby thing or is it an older kid thing as well? So they talk about that sort of 95% of children or even more will have this by the age of two. So the answer is it isn't normal for them as in because they're falling outside those kind of normal ranges. But I wouldn't say it's abnormal. I wouldn't be greatly concerned about the child's 
immune system or anything else like that if they develop roseola at five. I think that likely they've just been very lucky and have just threaded the Swiss cheese of holes and just dodged every other roseola they've ever met. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly not, it's certainly not uh, abnormal, but I wouldn't be greatly concerned about it. It would yes. be interesting to see, though. Yeah, yeah I know. As, as, you know. as a clinician, I'm sure. But... Yeah. Yeah. Seeing like, like a 10-year-old with roseola, that would be good. <laughs> Excellent. So we have been chatting for an extraordinarily long time tonight and I'm sure everybody has uh, their bed or their favourite TV program to get to. So we might end it now, but don't fear because we will be back again with the Cub Care team and I'm hoping maybe if you guys put some fabulous comments down below about how wonderful Azure has been tonight, maybe we can start to come back and do one of these again because what we want is we want to be able to give really good evidence-based information to you so you don't need to try and sift through everything that is on Google trying to find some good information. So please type in the comments below what information you want to know about. What would you like to know when it comes to your children's health? And we will absolutely do one of these. We'll do multiple Facebook Lives again. So thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you so much uh, to Dr. Azza. And we will see you soon. So make sure that you have liked the CPR Kids page and the Cub Care page so you don't miss out on all of this great information again. Have a good mm -hmm. evening, everyone. We'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you.